We have uh, Ode here today, and uh, Ode, maybe you know you can start by introducing yourself uh, a little bit. I could uh, attempt to it, but I'm sure you will do a much better job at talking about it yourself. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is uh, Ode Turjman. Uh, I'm a musician and a music educator by profession. And uh, lately, I uh, also started a music therapy program. And uh, about uh, 10 years ago, I went through a certain experience which directed my attention in a different way. And uh, I started my research, my own um, research in neuroscience, uh, investigating the nature of self and consciousness. And uh, I published two papers. Uh, the first one is called uh, On the Role of Mirror Neurons in the Sense of Self. And the second one is about uh, neural processes uh, underlying enlightenment. So uh, uh, this is in, uh, in short. Very good. So before we come to talk about uh, a book that you've just uh, released, maybe, you know, we can, uh, I think a rather topical question is, uh, how are you feeling now? And how would you describe your current state? Yeah. So to describe my state now, I have to talk a little bit about what happened, you know, <laughs> the experience I mentioned, uh, which was in 2008. Um, something happened and uh, uh, I went into a state where there was a discontinuity in my sense of self-consciousness. That is, my sense of self became discontinuous. I'm not uh, self-aware all the time. And uh, so uh, I, like I said, investigated that. But uh, since then, this is my state. Um, sometimes I'm in a state where I, there are thoughts, uh, feelings, uh, and so on. And other uh, times, uh, I just have no uh, sense at all, just sensory perceptions, you know, uh, uh, working on their own. So if I want to describe my state now, it's not easy, you know. I've become accustomed to it but uh, it's not easy because to to have goals to have desires to have uh, dreams in life you have to have continuity in thinking in the sense of self so when this becomes discontinuous it becomes difficult to uh, maintain you know your desires or uh, like i said goals or whatever you want to do so <laughs> it's not easy Okay, so uh, I think you, you've introduced a few concepts there already, which are uh, expanded uh, into, into the book. So uh, the book that you have now released, which is called Life Without a Self. Yes. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a book that actually, while I was reading, is pretty hard to put down, you know, once you start reading them. But yet there are a lot of uh, concepts that are being brought forward. Uh, that each time, you know, you want to, to stop and reflect on it and then come back to it, uh, but um, challenge it in, in your own mind, you know, how these things apply to, to your own experience and try to, to assimilate them uh, as you move on. But uh, if we are, you know, let, we, we're talking to a number of people here, so we have the opportunity to, to hear from you. How do you anticipate, how would you like the reader to go about this book, you know, how do you think is the best way to make the most out of it? Uh, and uh, basically, if there was an instruction manual for it, uh, what what would that be? Yeah, you know, the reader has to be patient a little bit uh, because I started with the uh, first chapter. It's the most difficult one. Not difficult uh, in how it's written, you know, or the language, but uh, because it is not the usual way of explaining the, uh, the nature of self and consciousness. So it just takes a little bit, you know, to be patient with going through this, to understand uh, where uh, my, the concepts come from, you know. So uh, the neural, uh, like I said, underpinnings of the self and consciousness in very simple way. And when you have that uh, clear, it's easy to go through the rest of the book, which talks about, you know, based on this understanding of the self and consciousness, then what are thoughts, how do they arise, the nature of our emotions, you know, are they innate or are they acquired, uh, relationships, all of this become easier to understand and see how they function in us when we understand the root 
cause or the root of what of uh, this feeling of self you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, going back to what you were saying earlier, so this book came at, at the back and following your second paper uh, as well that you published, uh, Enlightenment, Exploring the Natural Basis of uh, Preconsciousness. And it actually explores further some key concepts that you, you speak about initially in that paper. And uh, you're taking them to a more practical day-to-day -day dimension that, that people can actually very easily uh, relate to. So one thing that uh, striked me is the structure of this uh, of this book, which is quite peculiar in the sense that you've gone about it from a Q and A um, side of things. So where where did this idea come from uh, in the in writing this book in this uh, in this way? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I didn't have any intention to write a book, and it's just a coincidence that uh, I think 2016. I was in contact with uh, uh, one of Yuji Krishnamurti's friend, you know, uh, Yuji Krishnamurti is a known uh, spiritual teacher. He likes to, uh, you know, uh, uh, consider himself a philosopher, not a spiritual teacher, because he does not believe that the natural state or enlightenment is something uh, uh, spiritual. It's a physical, uh, neurological state, what they call enlightenment and the natural state. So I was in contact with one of his friends, uh, Nariana Murti, and he was in contact with a friend of his, you know, Richard. And uh, while talking to Richard, he told him, you know, I'm in contact with somebody who says who went into this natural state, if you like to contact him, you know. So I started with Richard, uh, long uh, uh, conversations over Skype, uh, he was on the spiritual path and seeking, and uh, he had many questions and so on. So we were recording those conversations, and Richard decided that, you know, he wants to transcribe, transcribe them and, uh, uh, you know, talked about the idea of publishing them in a book. So that's what happened, you know, it was, if not for him, you know, there will be no book. Excellent, excellent. So quite a, quite a few people involved there, and uh, and ideas of how to make them more digestible, which is which is great for us because we all get to share with you these uh, these uh, these ideas and these discussions that you've had. So we've mentioned a couple of times that there are some key concepts that are explored and addressed in this book, and I have to say sometimes in a rather disruptive way, uh, where you actually take well-established or what we consider well-established ideas and just look at them in a in a disruptive different uh perspective so can you maybe uh take us through the what are the key concepts that are explored so that the reader uh can look forward you know to to understanding them further and and basically look a little bit more in depth as to how they are dis disruptive uh, in the current ways of thinking and known practices, because that's really what you went against in a way. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, the most important thing uh, uh, you will find in the book of uh, how I explain the nature of, like I said, the self and consciousness, you know. Generally, when they talk about the self, they either you know, consider it an illusion uh, or uh, in, uh, describe it as a psychological uh, process. It's not even an entity. In spirituality, they distinguish between two uh, kinds of self, the ego, which is the usual daily uh, self-experience, and the other one is they call the pure self or essential self, uh, which is they call, consider spiritual. Okay, so... But what I found through my own uh, experience that I went through when I observed myself uh, with this discontinuity in self-consciousness and what happened, and with the research that I have done afterwards, is that we have two self-experiences, but they are not psychological, they are not spiritual, they are physical uh, processes uh, carried out by the brain. And actually, uh, the, the self is not something that is needed. It, can, it comes as a consequence, as a, a byproduct of other processes which are related to communication, you know, verbal and nonverbal. And along with these communication processes, uh, the, we have two sense of self-experiences arising, arising with them. 
So this is, I think, the main, you know, diversion from the how usually the self is described and so on. And the same applies to consciousness because I don't see that there's a different be difference between self and consciousness, you know. You have one sense which is self-consciousness or ego. Uh, and uh, so uh, without uh, this self-consciousness, you cannot experience the self. Without the self, there is no self-consciousness with it. And the other one, the, what they call the pure self or pure consciousness, it's a visual process, you know, byproduct of uh, commun uh, nonverbal communication related to fa facial uh, expression and facial gestures. Yes. So you actually make a, a clear distinction here between the physical and the spiritual experiences. So let's go back a little bit to how these things originated in, in, in your mind, you know, how these concept, concepts came, came along. And uh, maybe, you know, in, in brief, because I know that they're, they're explained really clearly in, in the book, but can you maybe like expand a little bit more on your experience and, and what actually happened on that day that uh, brought these along? Yes. Uh, so, like I said, in 2008, I uh, was working on a music education program and all of a sudden I felt I could not breathe. I thought I was having, having a heart attack. So uh, one of my colleagues, you know, took me to the nearby doctor, you know, and, uh, but then I realized that, as he said, that what I have is some kind of a panic attack, you know, uh, because of uh, stress and uh, he advised me to take a rest, you know. So I was taking, you know, some um, um, uh, anti-anxiety medication for some time. And then I decided that, you know, I would not uh, take them anymore and ready to face the fear, you know, whatever the consequences. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't advise anybody to do this because this was a personal choice, you know, you should not, uh, you know, there is some consequences for withdrawal with such medication. But anyway, this is what I did. <laughs> And so I didn't stop taking it. After two weeks, I had a panic attack. I stayed there, you know, uh, ready to uh, whatever happens. And uh, it was so intense. My heart was beating so hard. I could not take a breath. And I felt really I was going to die, but I was ready, you know, for whatever happens afterwards. But then all of a sudden, you know, um, my uh, thoughts were silent, no thoughts anymore. Uh, no feelings, uh, just like uh, as if something was emptied, you know, at once, all of a sudden. Um, I looked, you know, my, at my hands, at my legs. I didn't know what I was looking at. So there was no, I didn't have a body, you know. I can see something, but I don't know what it is. I looked, you know, in front of me and space became two-dimensional, like I was looking at an image, you know, not, uh, there is no depth, third uh, dimension. So, and... Uh, and no memories. I didn't know who I am at that moment, you know, any, any memories about the past. So it took a little while and then uh, consciousness, you know, or self-consciousness, you know, was back. But afterwards, this became something repetitive, you know, uh, coming, like I said, discontinuous again and again and again. And what I realized, you know, that self-consciousness was gone and everything was gone including uh, thoughts feelings the exp body experience is when this inner uh, self voice what we call self-talk when we talk to about our, to ourselves was silent or all of a sudden so the uh, the absence of this voice in the head uh, was related to everything else so that's what i wanted to investigate why why what does this inner self voice has to do with consciousness and this experience of self. And another thing that I also noticed afterwards is that whenever the, there were no thoughts, I was in that state, I could see an image of my face like projected in space in front of me. Uh, and it was, what it was doing is like a, an a online simulation moment by moment to how my face, facial expressions were. I could see them exactly what, what the facial expressions were. And it was moving with the picture, was moving with the movement of my eyes. So then it came to my mind, you know, I remembered when, because I, at that time afterwards, I read some books on spirituality, you know, and they were talking about the observer, the witness, uh, silent watcher. Uh, so, um, 
and they call the pure consciousness the observing witness consciousness. So I said, you know, are they related? Because why do they describe this pure self, pure consciousness in visual terms, you know, like observer, witness, uh, somebody who's looking, watching. And then I related it to that experience. So that's why, you know, uh, that made sense that it's related to, because seeing yourself, you know, makes you self-aware. You see a face and you recognize it as your own face, so there is self-awareness. But this self-awareness is not accompanied by thoughts, feelings, or a body experience, because these are produced by another system, which is related to the inner voice and uh, uh, not related to the visual uh, facial mirror. So then there was, I mean, clearly there was a very strong uh, personal experience that, uh, yeah. that you then followed up with, uh, with quite some scientific uh, research as per, uh, as per various things that, that, that you mentioned. So yeah. uh, just switching a little bit uh, tone here, because we always think you know, about how these kind of experience then bring positivity, how this kind of experience changes in a good way. But realistically there are some parts in this book that seem uh, I, I would describe them as a little bit you know like gloomy and, and dark reflections as well so uh, in cases even considering whether there's any point looking for happiness uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and towards the end uh without giving anything away but you know there are some some interesting reflections about global issues as well and how these these things can uh, can be related to them so how should we as reader take all of this? You know, should we just say that there's no point or uh, how, how should we look at it? Yeah, uh, that, there was no intention, you know, that it will give this impression, you know, as gloomy or uh, uh, because actually uh, how I uh, worked about it is to present how things function, you know, regardless of how we want them to be, you see. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, happiness, okay, if, if we understand how, how I found is that the body cannot, can, cannot take stress for a long time and happiness, you know, we, it's something desirable, but for the body it's tension, you see, when you're happy and uh, so it can take it for some time afterwards, it, uh, you know, it cannot take it anymore and you feel uh, pain. So, uh, so if we understand how it functions, seeking happiness becomes the source of pain rather than something you know that desirable, if you understand physically how this functions. So when you don't seek, this is what may, may be difficult for some people to maybe to uh, take, which is that when you don't seek happiness, you will not be unhappy. <laughs> you see, happiness and unhappiness, they go together. You, because you're seeking happiness and it's not working, it's not working, not because something wrong with you, because physically, you know, the body cannot take it for a long time. So if you don't seek happiness, you will not be unhappy. They go together. So uh, it's not that, you know, there is no unhappiness. Uh, the same with love, you know, people appreciate love, you know, and uh, in daily life and uh, or religions or uh, philosophies, everybody's talking about the importance of love. But with love comes hate also, you know, you have, they go together because there's a, a, like duality in how we learn things, you know, including emotions uh, as love. So when you don't deal with love in that way, hate will also, you know, uh, will not be uh, the way it is now. The more they want love, <laughs> the more they create hate, hatred. <laughs> So that's why, you know, so it's not like something wrong with us as people. And I hope that the book will, uh, you know, uh, the reader will come to this uh, understanding that, you know, the more you, you realize how things are, you realize that uh, there is nothing wrong with you. It's what you have acquired, you know, and this is not yours. It's the cultural, social uh, influence. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's always good to, to see that balance and how that positivity and negativity actually work together. And, and yes, there's, there's quite a lot uh, explained on that uh, here as well. But let's, uh, let, let's look a little bit more at, at you and what this and what writing this book brought you as well, because in a way it kind of I you explained to us earlier how the whole idea of writing the book came along. But 
surely you know that must have taken uh, you through quite a little a few changes more from going from your self discovery of enlightenment and consciousness into imparting your learnings to support the self discovery of other people uh, as well so um did did this whole process of having to explain what you went through to somebody else and you know your perception uh did, did that change at all your perception of things um actually it's it's a little bit difficult when we come to this topic because usually people who go uh, through such a state uh you know they become considered as spiritual teachers or gurus and uh, and they want to uh, also transmit what they found, you know, their state to the others. But actually, it's a physical state and it doesn't work this way. It's not something spiritual or psychological that you can transmit to somebody or convince or, you know. So they came up with all kinds of meditation techniques, you know, uh, trying to be in that state. But actually, uh, when you think about it, did those spiritual teachers or guru come into that state through those techniques? No, <laughs> they didn't practice meditation to be in that state. It just happened to them. So why do you invent something that didn't work for you and convince the other people to do it? I'm saying this because I'm, that's what it taught me that I have to convey what I have found, not uh, because of the importance of what happened to, with me, because it doesn't matter, you know, it will not serve anybody. But for people who are on the, for example, spiritual path, or people on, on the path of self-help, you know, and trying to find some solutions for their problems. The solutions are not the solutions. Uh, you know, they are not appropriate uh, because uh, they are not based on, on real understanding of, of how, who we are, you know, and how we function. So, uh, so I thought maybe people who are with sometimes 20, 30, 40 years, you know, on a spiritual path, doing all kinds of meditations, going here and there, and not achieving anything or reaching anything, you know, because it's not something that can be transmitted easily. Interesting, interesting. So um, let's talk about, you just mentioned here, you know, problems. And that's actually quite a big word in, uh, in those few pages, because uh, there's also a whole concept of problems that don't exist, uh, which, uh, which again, you know, uh, look at things in a slightly different way. So, um, yeah, so th there is a good discussion that is picked up at various points in the group. But do you actually see this concept as a sustainable one? Everybody goes along uh, around saying they've got problems. And yeah. here comes Ode saying, actually, the problems don't exist. Yeah. Uh, let's take, for example, anger, okay? It's considered for, by society, you know, that it's a problem, you know, and they have all programs for anger management, you know, how to control yourself, how to deal with anger, and so on. But is the problem anger or our understanding of what anger is? You know, anger is a natural sensation. It comes up you know, as a response to some uh, stimulus. So it's, uh, it's in nature, you know, <laughs> and we are part of nature. So it's natural to, be, to, to feel anger and, and to be there. But the moment, you know, you turn it, you say that you should not be angry, you turn it into a problem. That's what I mean. It's a non-existing problem. Now it's a problem because you say anger is a problem. You have to deal with it. Uh, we, we will find, you know, a way to help you either through some medication or through some uh, meditation or all kinds of, you know, uh, solutions and uh, products and things that I produce for a non-existing problem, you see? Because not the problem is not anger, it's how they define the anger, you know, as something undesirable, something that you, sh you should not be there. And you, you can say that about most of the other things, you know. You should love, you know, if you don't love, what's the problem, you see? You don't feel it's that feeling. It's natural. This is who you are, how you feel. You know, the moment you, you take this idea that, no, I should be a loving person, so why I'm not, you know, fe feeling this feeling, you feel something is wrong with you, then <laughs> there's a problem there. How can I solve it? You know, what shall I do to feel, you know, this feeling of love? 
to be compassionate towards the others and so on, you see? And this is where the, all the kind of problems that we have, not really problems. It's uh, just, you know, with the creating problems so that they can sell the solutions. Nice. So um, through, throughout the book, the reader is actually uh, brought to think and to go through, uh, well, to think about really, a number of different status that one could find itself into. So it goes on about self, about no emotions, about the past, the present, uh, recognition, selfishness, uh, um, which I understand, you know, are all things that you have thought through a lot, uh, found yourself into as well. So uh, a little bit, you know, of a curiosity maybe, but what, what is the most attractive thing about the state of enlightenment uh, for you? Um, and uh, if you were given the possibility of staying in a state of enlightenment, yeah. then would you? Yeah. First, let me say that I don't like the term enlightenment, you know, because uh, it is used as a spiritual term mostly. But I, I prefer to use, you know, it's not my term, but the natural state, because it's really a natural phenomenon, you know. So what is the natural state? It's there in everybody. It's not, you know, that happens for a few people. The natural state is that uh, what happens, you know, biologically for every human being is that when there is a stimulus, you know, a response arises, you know, you have a sensory perception, okay? At that level and at the level of the sensory memory, the brain recognizing, you know, the stimulus, whether it's a visual, uh, you know, image or a sound, but there is no self-consciousness, you know, because it's not interested in self-consciousness. It's just in, interested to be aware of the environment around it so that it can take quick action, you know, as a part of survival. Now, we have learned, you know, as humans, another level, which is through language. So we learn to label things, give them names and use words, you know, to describe things and to, to describe the sensory perceptions and so on. And then this becomes part of our uh, daily living, which creates an inner voice inside us talking to ourselves. We learn to talk to others and then we repeat things to ourselves, you see. So this, once this starts, this inner self-talk, it becomes continuous because the, how the brain functions is that if a certain brain network is overstimulated, it becomes autonomous. It does not stop because the brain understands that it's needed. So we keep talking to ourselves, what's the natural state is that for some reason, this inner self-talk stops. The other layer of language and the things we acquire stops. So what remains is the first level of sensory perception and response to the environment, which is there in everybody. So it's not something, you know, you acquire, it's already there, you know, you just remove this layer of, uh, like I said, self-consciousness acquired through language and interactions with the so -so society. So what I found unique about this natural state is you find, I found, you know, that I don't want to be something other than what I am. You see, that's like a big, you know, discovery. What, you know, why I have been looking to be something other than what I am, to be this or that, like be a different person, you know. What's unique is this, you know, as it is. And I found that this uniqueness is in everybody, you know, we are all unique. And this is, I also find uh, uh, like evidence for in neuroscience, you know, no two brains are alike. Even uh, brains of, of twins, they are different. So if we are unique to that extent, the society wants us to be, you know, uh, look like, uh, you know, to, to, to be similar to each other. We are not, and that's the whole problem, the whole, you know, problem that the society created is that it created this, uh, you know, uh, desire to, to fit, you know, into a certain framework that everybody has to fit, to fit themselves in, you know, through the uh, different, uh, like, uh, social structures. And you have a struggle because you cannot, uh, um, you know, fight your uniqueness. So you have to fight it to fit into the society. And this is the struggle that goes all the time, you know. So between this uniqueness that is there in everybody that does not resemble anybody else, and with this other image that the society creates and you want to, to be in, you see? So once you discover your, your uniqueness, you don't want to be in that, uh, you know, state anymore, you know, and to, to, to be like anybody else or to fit in, into anything that the society wants you to fit in. 
It's just a very uh, liberating thing, you know, without doing anything, just discovering that you are unique the way you are, you know, without doing anything. Brilliant. So uh, just to, to touch on something something else as well, and, and again, another concept that, that's explored. So would you say that you can, by, by writing this book, you know, and by people reading it, would you say that you can trigger the eco-mirror system in, in readers, assuming people understand or maybe you want to expand a little bit on what the eco-mirror system yeah, actually yeah. is? Yeah. The echo-mirror system is the uh, neurological system that produces what we experience as the inner self-talk or inner self-voice. This is the echo-mirror system, okay? So uh, how we understand each other, you know, uh, when you speak, for example, when you talk to me, my uh, echo-mirror system echoes your words uh, in my own head, okay? But using my own voice. So I hear your words inside of me using my own voice. This is what the mirrors, you know, and this is what creates self-awareness or I, because there's a voice that I recognize as I, you know. So, uh, and when this voice is triggered, which are the, the words, with the words come the memories that I have learned about them, you know, and any word, you know, for example, if we say the word tree, you're saying tree, it occurs the word tree inside my head and with tree, I have the memories of what I've learned, what a tree is, you know, how it looks like, how many trees and so on. So, so actually the mirroring is not direct mirroring. I cannot understand or mirror exactly what you say or what you feel or what you think. What I mirror is that your words and then the words bring my own memories my own thoughts, feelings, emotions, whatever I have accumulated about those words. So, so actually the mirroring is a very subjective experience. That's why we have problem in communication, you know, because we, we cannot biologically uh, listen exactly to the other person. What we listen to is our own interpretation. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so again, you know, a bit of a disruptive uh, book and concepts. And in particular, there, there's in a number of times where you really uh, challenge some definitions, which are, I think, you know, well established in Buddhism, in meditations. So maybe this comes across a little bit of a, you know, controversial, provocative question. But don't you think people will see you as a little bit arrogant? for challenging these kind of well-established concepts? Oh, oh. Uh, I don't uh, see it as arrogance, you know. I'm, I'm just, uh, I didn't take things for granted, you know. People who went through such experience, the natural state, they immediately, you know, uh, read what similar people who passed through such an experience, what they felt, what they described, you know. And they just adapted what they said, you know, and immediately most of them, they, you know, turn into spiritual teachers and so on. But for me, when, when it happened, I didn't take it for granted. I read some spirituality books. I tried to find out what it is and so on. But I was not convinced, you know, so I did uh, more than six years of research in uh, neuroscience, uh, observing myself, reading, trying to understand what it really is. So it doesn't come out of arrogance or out of, you know, trying to undermine what the other says or the traditions, whether in Buddhism or other traditions. I'm just conveying what I have found, you know, is that there is no spiritual basis for, for the spirit. That's great. So just, just to end off, if um, you were to, you know, somebody's in front of, a, of this cover, book cover and thinks, is this for me or is it not for me? Who is this book actually for? Uh, I In think three it, words, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it, it may appeal to different, you know, people, people who are uh, uh, on the spiritual path. It will, you know, they will see things in a different way, understand really what enlightenment, the natural state is, and so on. Uh, people, uh, you know, who are not involved in spirituality, but feel that they have problems in daily life, you know, like we said, in uh, feelings, relationships, and so on. They can find also a lot, you know, that explains why and the cause of things and, you know, make, eases the burden, you know, for people because it, uh, it lifts the burden from being my burden, you know, and as if believing the thoughts are mine and so on, to understanding that they are all acquired, you know, and I have no uh, uh, really responsibility for what is going on. 
So I think it may appeal, and even it may, it will, you know, uh, also to people in neuroscience and uh, people investigating the nature of self and consciousness, because uh, whether in philosophy, neuroscience, uh, psychology, because it uh, also uh, uh, puts forward a new explanation of what consciousness is scientifically, what the self is, and so on, you know. And it will be beneficial for them also, because I think one of the problems in neuroscience is that neuroscientists are, are looking for self-consciousness, you know, or for consciousness, and without themselves understanding what consciousness is. You see, how can you look for something if you don't know what it is? Yeah. So by, by, you know, clarifying what consciousness is, then when you study it, it will be clear when you find how, where it is, you know, how it functions, uh, and so on. So that's what I hope, you know, it will can serve several people, you know, or... Uh, Brilliant. So thank you very much. Uh, I guess it's a, a book for a lot of people, for a vast audience <laughs> with scientific research behind it, with a lot of personal experiences behind it, and uh, a, a pleasure for people to be able to share this experience with you. So thank yeah. you very much, Ode. Thank you. Thank you very much, you know, for giving me this opportunity to express what it is.